Today we continue in our study in the book of Colossians and we're in chapter 3. And we want to read the 25 verses of Colossians 3. But before we do, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and for your mercy to us. Life is so complex, and Lord, we are so weak. You know that we are but dust. And so, Lord, we need your help and your direction in all that we do in our lives. And we pray, Father, that today, that you might teach us and visit us and instruct us and help us and providentially care for us that we might do your will, that we might learn your truth, that we might believe your word. And so, Father, we commit this study and this day to your keeping and to your will. Because, Lord, you know what's ahead of us and you know what we need. And we thank you that you're faithful, ever on the job, to provide what we need in your Son. It's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Since, and this word if, in the Greek, oftentimes has a positive answer and should be translated since, and I think it's so here. Since ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, for your dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore the members which are upon the earth, fornication and uncleanness and inordinate affection, evil desires and covetous, which is idol worship, for which things sake the wrath of God come upon the sons of disobedience, in the which you once walked when you lived in them, but now you have put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds, and have put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcision nor barbarian, Scythian, bond or, nor free, but Christ is all in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindnesses, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on love, which is the bond of, of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are called in one body, be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, and <clears throat> singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatever ye do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto men, 
knowing that the Lord of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. There is an old saying that has a lot of truth in it. Who knows what a day will bring forth. And we don't know what today has in it. Until the day is over and past, we don't know what things good and bad may be there. We don't know what events are there. We don't know what needs we will have. We don't know what joys we will experience. We don't know what blessings will be there. We don't know what pain and sorrow may be there. And Paul starts this third chapter in this letter in discussion of the superiority and the preeminence, the, the, the need to know and to place and to look to Christ as first in the Christian life, as God the Son, equal with the Godhead and part of it. And his cross work is the means by which our salvation is accomplished. And Paul looks at that and he begins this third chapter saying, Since you're risen with Christ. Now, how are we risen with Christ? We're risen with Christ spiritually, if we're saved. Because we have believed in Him and trusted in Him. We receive His life, the life of the resurrected Son of God who was a man who went to the cross and paid for our sin, but death could not defeat him, and he rose again, and it is that risen Christ that lives within our hearts and is our life. And since we are risen with Christ spiritually, and maybe too Paul has in mind, certainly he does in verse 4, he has in mind that future event when Jesus will come back for his church in the clouds, and appear and we shall be with him forever and we shall receive our eternal bodies then we shall actually go up from this earth and be with Christ and receive that eternal resurrected body and I think he has both things in mind here both are certainly true since we are risen with Christ and Christ is our future and Christ is preeminent since these things are true how should we live now? The future is such an uncertain thing. Nobody knows what tomorrow will be. Nobody knows what the rest of today will be. But we know that if we live, we shall have responsibilities in the future. We know that if we live, we shall have needs, material and spiritual, in the future. We know that if we live and God gives us freedom and, and movement, we will have work to do in the future. I guess because of our lifestyles today and our philosophies, and friend, this shouldn't be your philosophy, though it's the philosophy of the world. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And we don't think about tomorrow, we just want to live today and pack in it everything we can get in it. And it's not so good to dwell upon the past, either its glories or its miseries. The past is gone, it cannot suffice for today. And I know that today is the only day that we have, the future is not yet. And when it gets here, it will be today, I realize that. And so. We live our lives a moment at a time and a day at a time. But I tell you that the world is so concerned about enjoying today and sinning today and fulfilling their desires today that they give no thought to the future and it is a very unwise thing for all of us will die and all of us will go out into eternity to face God. And all of us have a future even if we're saved and going to heaven. Who is it that runs that place called heaven? Who is it that's in charge of that place? Who will judge us when we get there? It is our God that we give an account to for this thing that we call life. 
And so Paul in this third chapter, I think, is saying we must live. And we must live in view of eternity. And that's what we have in verses 1 through 3. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear and we shall be caught up with Him, we're going to go to heaven to our completed salvation. But we're going to have to give an account of our life here. And some of it is in the future. Some of it is before you. And you need to make Christ preeminent in your future by the things that you do and the way that you live. And so we say today, we must make Christ preeminent in our future. And why must we do that? We must do that because we must destroy the forces of the flesh in verses 5 through 17. Since you're risen with Christ, since you have a future with Him, since He is preeminent in your judge and your God and your life, and since you will give an account of how you live and let Him live in you and through you, since that is true, Paul says in verses 5 through 17, destroy, destroy the forces and workings of the flesh. It is a warfare word. Mortify. Kill. Destroy. We are soldiers for the cross of Christ. We face battles in our future. We face struggles. There are two forces within our own being in our life. And one of them is our own worst, greatest enemy. And it is ourselves. The old man, the flesh. And here Paul talks about the old man and the new man. And the old man is the sinful nature that we were born with. And the new man is the life of Christ. And Paul said because you're risen with Christ, you're going to need to make Christ preeminent in your future because you must destroy the forces and the working of that old man. And what does that old man do and what does he produce? And Paul says because of the old man and its sins, the wrath of God comes upon the unsaved because of their sin. And in verse 7, uh, we lived like that before we got saved. And what does the old man produce? And will produce even now if we live in his power and his strength. He produces anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication. Have you listened to people talk in the world? And all the the unspeakable words that they use and all the cursings and the swearings and all the anger and the malice and the hatred and the unkindness and the selfishness and the greed and the lust and the sin of the human heart. And you can just listen today and it's there and it's evident and this is what we battle and this is what's in the nature of the unsaved man. And this is what's in the nature of us. That old unsaved part of us. The old man. That causes us to lie one to another. And not be honest. And not seek another's good. And not do what is right. And Paul said put off the deeds of the old man. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him and make Christ preeminent. Because Christ is the new man. And Christ is your life. And, and in verse 12. What does the new man produce? He's holy and beloved and tender mercies and kindnesses and humbleness of mind and meekness in character and long-suffering and patient with other people and forbearing other people and forgiving people when they sin against you and do you wrong because Jesus has done that for us. And that's the new man. We must battle the forces of the flesh in the future and so we must make Christ preeminent in our future lives as we live here on this earth. And then Paul says if we do that, verse 15, that the peace of God will be the umpire in our life. And here's a, a good way to know what God wants. When you think and pray and agonize and read your Bible about a situation, Paul says let the peace of God be the umpire when you can have peace about a thing and leave it with God's provision and care and rest in it, then you're probably in a good and proper place. And he says that we're to sing and be rejoicing and admonish each other with songs and hymns 
and the melody and the goodness and the gladness and the joy of our heart in giving thanks to God. And this comes from making Christ preeminent and the new man living within our lives. I tell you, we have battles ahead, and we have the flesh to deal with ahead, and we have sins to face and reject ahead. I hope we don't have sins to commit ahead. We need to avoid that, and we need to live in the new man and not the old, and therefore Christ must be preeminent in our future. And Christ must be preeminent in our futures because we must preserve the unity of our family. And life is being ripped apart all around us today. And one of the things that the devil has been able to do, he has been able to destroy the, the unity and the loveliness of homes and even Christian homes. Home is no longer a safe haven for many people. It is no longer a place of peace and rest and kindness and love and tenderness and share. Home is a battleground. Home is a warfare. Home is anger and fighting and fussing and selfishness and pride and arrogance and domination and hurt and defeat. And God would not have it so. But if we are to have homes that are the way that God wants them to be, Christ is going to have to preserve that. Friend, you're not strong enough and big enough and smart enough. You don't know how you're going to change in a year or two or three or four. And you don't know how anybody else in your family is going to change and what they're going to want different from what they want now. And so he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. I wish women knew that God gives them freedom and loving and, and honoring their husband. And I wish husbands knew the, the joy and love of a wife that, that, that they loved and honored and lifted up and helped and thought of and worked for and served and, and provided for. And, and a home like that is a home where Christ is preeminent. So he says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. And husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter against them. Don't be angry with them because you're... Your, your love and your responsibility and really your joy ought to be to live and help your wife not to get your own needs satisfied. And he said, children, uh, obey your parents in, in all things. You're under their authority and as long as they are in the Lord and tell you to do what's right, then you have responsibility to obey them and to be helped and nurtured till you can grow up and take your own responsibility. And fathers, don't mistreat your children and don't be overbearing. But have discipline and godliness in your home. But don't be overbearing and rule your authority like a whip. And so we must preserve what is important to God. And God knows that our homes are a very important thing that will influence life and future. And so Paul says, make Christ preeminent in your future and in your home. And then we must make Christ preeminent in our future because we must perform due service to men in verses 22 to 25. And so he talks to servants. Now we're not slaves today in America. Oh, I know how you talk about the the slave driver down and who the work where's your boss, but bosses really have very little authority in, in America in two thousand today. They need some, by the way. And I wish sometimes we had more structure on our jobs and more principles that would guide what we do and don't do, and then maybe we would have less chaos and confusion. But we're not slaves like they were some people were in Paul's day. But we do have responsibilities to other human beings. And we can't identify with what Paul said to slaves maybe when he said, don't just do it because you want to uh, uh, flatter them or make it easier for you because you appear to be wanting to please them. Do it because you're doing it unto the Lord and you really are trying to be obedient and loving and, and servicing and working and doing what God would have you to do. 
Do it heartily as unto the Lord, not just because of them. And the Lord will reward you for that. And anybody that, that does contrary to that will bear the, the reward of his efforts and his service. We have responsibilities to other people, to our school, to our government, as citizens, to our employers, to the people that we minister and work with in our local churches. There are responsibilities. We pay taxes. We give information. We, we take part in government, at least in voting and choosing and expressing our opinion. There are things that must be done in the future, and all of those things need the preeminence of Christ. Friend, have you noticed something about the Word of God? And we've said it before. It's really all about it's really all about Him, our salvation, our life, our future. It should be about who we value and what we love and who we love and who we praise and who we worship and who we adore and who we keep that special place for us in our hearts. There is but one throne in the room of your heart, your soul. And whoever sits on that throne controls your life. There is but one person that should be on that throne, and that person is Jesus. And so Paul says, since Christ is your future, and since you're going to heaven, and since you are risen with Him now and have His spiritual life, and you know the joy of letting Him live through you and in you and be your power, since these things are true, in your future, make Christ preeminent. I don't know what the future will hold. But if there is a future, and there is for me as long as I live, and if there is for me after I go to heaven, I'm never going to cease to be. I have a future. I'm going to be there, and God is going to be there. And so God is what matters in my future. Christ, preeminent, exalted, superior, lifted up, praised and adored, honored and worshipped. It is God's plan. It is God's work. It is God's will. May it be our life and our experience to our blessing, to our good, I pray.